Anamalia connects accomplished Hollywood veterans with young creatives from Central Europe to exploit the all-time high demand for animation content. The goal? To lay the foundations for quality, expertly crafted, audience-driven feature films and series. Anamalia Story and Art Labs is an animation incubator that provides artists with the ideal platform to achieve box office and global distribution success. In 2020, despite the worldwide pandemic, we managed to host our fifth edition of the Intensive Professional Incubator in the heart of picturesque Chesky Krumlov. Individual teams worked on a total of five films and six series, each with a unique vision. Directors and screenwriters had the opportunity to consult their stories with experienced Hollywood mentors Robert Lentz and Shelley Hoffman. For feature films, they discovered how to identify key narrative moments or story beats. For series, they learned how to develop different episodic treatments. Under the guidance of experienced directors, including Emmy Award-winning art director Rustem Hasanoff, these story beats were broken down further into character and environment design. These concepts were then used to create the final story images before applying the finishing touches at our digital painting workshop. Here, under the tutelage of art director Tomasz Duhek, participants were shown how to grab an audience's attention using color, light, and atmospherics. At Anamalia, we connect the future with now. We plan to expand the incubator to include a real-time production pipeline, representing a new paradigm for animation film development and production. This will involve teams working on look development to create animated samples and teasers for their films and series. In another exciting development, we'll be working with Unreal Engine, the state-of-the-art 3D platform that's revolutionizing the animation industry. Anamalia, boost your project. And welcome to Animation for Series. My name is Shelley Hoffman, and I am honored to be invited by the Central and Eastern European Animation Forum to deliver this keynote address on building an international career in an Anglo-centric market. Now, as you may know from my bio, and I hope you've done a little detective work, I've spent 25 years writing, developing, and show running animation for series. With my partner, I've written over 500 episodes of animation. And while I live and work in Canada, I also work with producers and broadcasters in the US, UK, Germany, Australia, Japan, Korea, and China. And I'm hoping that as all of you build your careers over the years, that you will get a chance to extend your influence and creativity all over the globe. So let's take some time right now to discuss how you can make that happen. Let's look at what I will be covering in this keynote. Networking and connections, what international buyers are looking for, character-driven stories, demographics, right now to discuss how types of series animation, and diversity and representation. I'll begin by saying that when I started writing for animated series, I was lucky, very, very lucky. New cable channels dedicated to animation were opening up in Canada and the US and the traditional broadcasters had decided that in order to compete with those cable channels, they needed new original programming for when their young viewers came home from school or just settled down for a bowl of cereal on Saturday mornings. The fact is that broadcasters had been showing the same 20 or 10 year old reruns of cartoons for years, but now everyone in the industry was hungry for new content. I was also lucky in the fact that the Canadian animated series scene was exploding. Traditionally, we had held some international recognition for our animated shorts, which were funded by the National Film Board, also known as the NFB. But aside from these animated shorts being shown at festivals, uh, in preschools, and the occasional Academy Awards show, they did not have much of a life. Similarly, there were a handful of animated features that got attention, some of it not very good attention, but they were only shown at festivals and perhaps for a short run at cinemas in Canada. So once again, 
there wasn't a profit to come from them and they only got limited audiences. Then, with the rising demand for entertainment for kids, two Canadian animation production houses saw their chance and grew in size and scope. Suddenly, animated series were getting greenlit one after another and then getting renewed for a second season before the first season had even finished scripting. At the time, I had no idea how amazing and singular this all was. Other lucky developments coincided with this moment. Funding from the Canadian Media Fund, which I will talk about later, and also a model for tax credits focused on how much Canadian talent was actually being used in the making of these animated series. These were the elements that launched the Canadian animation industry into the world view. And I was able to take advantage of that to start my career. Now, I'll just take a moment to explain how our Canadian Media Fund, which we call the CMF, works or more accurately used to work. In order to hold a broadcasting license, Canadian broadcasters have to contribute a certain amount of money into a pool that then gets redistributed to them in order to develop and then hopefully take Canadian shows to series. Once again, I was lucky to start my career at a time when the CMF was so fully funded that one Canadian broadcaster could tri trigger what we call full freight funding. That means that all the production costs were covered in exchange for that broadcaster getting to premiere the show. Then any international sales were pure profit for the production company. But now with viewers watching most of their entertainment through streamers rather than cable broadcasters, those days of easier funding are gone. These days, Canadian broadcasters insist that we have international sales in place before they pull the trigger and green light a show. So producers have to scramble to put together funding with at least two parties, and usually it's more, before they can hope to go into production. And finally, I was also lucky because I came from a comedy background where I had learned not only to write comedy quickly, but also to story tell on my feet. Because that is what we're all here to do, tell stories. Think about it. At every stage in the process, you must be able to tell your story. It starts in your own head, building and telling the story to yourself before you put it down on screen or paper. Then you must tell your story to your team, where hopefully you will collaborate and grow your story. And after that, you will have to tell your story over and over and over again to broadcasters, streamers, funding bodies, and well, anyone who might have a spare dollar to make a gamble with. So you can imagine how many times you need to tell your story and how good you need to be at telling it. So yes, Luck, especially when it comes to timing, has been a super important component in my career. Now, 25 years later, you are dealing with a different landscape. Where will your luck come from? And more importantly, how will you make your luck? I did a little research on the funding possibilities of many of your countries that are represented in this forum and it's clear that a good deal of you are struggling to get financial support, uh, uh, let alone uh, recognition for your series in countries. Most of your government funding for animation is focused on shorts or feature films, just like how Canadian animation was mostly funded by our National Film Board over 30 years ago. The countries that are exceptions to this trend are doing real business internationally. And a great example of this is Ireland, whose tax incentives are strong, and as it happens, extremely compatible with Canadian tax incentives. Now, my writing partner and I have been able to take advantage of this compatibility a couple of times, writing scripts and doing development in partnership with Irish companies. In fact, before this pandemic hit, 
One of our IPs was optioned by an Irish company with a view towards a combination live action animated co-production in Canada. Unfortunately, COVID hit a couple months later and that was that. But companies are looking for these kinds of relationships and you should too. Everyone you meet at these conferences is a potential partner. I know it's hard to mix and mingle in these lockdown online times, but that doesn't mean you can't meet new people and yes, even make friends. Networking, connections, these aren't just trendy words that make you roll your eyes. They're the building blocks of a strong and long career. At conferences, I've chatted with people I've been standing beside in the hall while waiting for another appointment. We weren't trying to sell each other anything. We were just having a, a chat. Then a year or many years later, I ended up finally doing business with that person. Being open in this way has also allowed me to connect people I know with other people I know. That kind of generosity builds your, repu your reputation. So remember, networking doesn't only go one way, but you can see how important it is. A great example of this was last October when I had the privilege of teaching Story Lab for Series at Animalia. It's a two week intensive writing room for animation projects. When we started the course, the participants didn't know each other at all. Some were even deathly afraid of having to read and speak about their work in front of strangers. But through hearing each other's work and giving positive and constructively critical notes, as well as socializing together, the nine participants became friends and supporters. They will now be connected for all of their careers. They may never work together directly in the future, but they will always be a resource for each other. And for me too, because now they are a part of my network. So I can't emphasize this strongly enough. No man or woman is an island in this business of making an animated series. It just can't be done alone, especially in these belt tightening financial times. So make a point of developing your network and you will always have people to bounce ideas off, pull into projects, or just commiserate with you when things aren't going the way they should. They might even help you find new ways to finance and greenlight your IP. You'll be surprised at how much they making new connections will help your career. Speaking of new corrections, connections, so let's move on to the topic of IPs that have gotten international sales. But first, I'll just take a moment to explain what an IP is for those that don't know. IP means intellectual property. And in a general sense, this term could refer to any creation covered by copyright, trademark, or patent. But for those of us developing series, it is the core of your show including your characters. Now, please bear with me on this example of an international blockbuster because it is shamelessly commercial, which isn't always a totally bad thing. It's literally been designed to tick all of the boxes and it will illustrate a number of things I need to bring to your attention when pitching to international buyers. Paw Patrol. No one with a preschool child can escape the power of Paw Patrol. But for those of you who don't have kids or have been stranded on a desert island for the past decade, the series focuses on a young boy named Ryder who leads a crew of search and rescue dogs who call themselves the Paw Patrol. These pups and their spirited 10-year-old boy leader have been going on adventures and selling millions of dollars in toys books, clothes, lunch boxes, et cetera, et cetera, all over the world for eight years and counting. It has spawned spin-offs and copycats, and it will be a touchstone for animated preschool pitching for at least a decade more. But the question is, what has made it so successful? It probably won't be a surprise to any of you that Paw Patrol comes out of a production company that started as a toy company called Spin Master. In 2009, they put out a call to a select group of creators for their pitch 
on a preschool series rooted in action and adventure with relatable, exciting, and aspirational characters and stories for young children. The creator of Bob the Builder won with a pitch called Robbie's Rescue Dogs. Then, with the Spin Master team, workshopped this initial concept, finally producing Paw Patrol, which first aired in North America in 2013. This juggernaut is currently entering its eighth season on Nickelodeon and airs in 160 countries in 30 languages and counting. Around 2007, Spin Master started developing cartoon shows around their most popular toys. I remember getting hired to work on Bakugan, a very popular toy that was launched in Japan with an animated series. We were going to write the English version of the episodes and went in for a meeting. Now this was all just after the US real estate market meltdown and all the Canadian animated production houses were laying off people. But Spin Master couldn't have been more busy or more optimistic. And that's because the animated series that they were producing weren't the only way the IP was paying off. They were also, in essence, commercials for selling their toys and games. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm suggesting that the only way to create and produce an animated series is to be as shamelessly commercial as Spin Master and Paw Patrol. But when you are developing your IPs into series, you must keep in mind that animation is expensive. And not only is it expensive, but it takes years of commitment from a huge team of people before it reaches the screens. And still, there's no guarantee of the series breaking even, let alone paying off. So production companies and broadcasters are looking for pitches that have the potential for cross-platforming and multiple seasons. We'll look at cross-platforming a little bit later. As for multiple seasons, most production companies, broadcasters, and streamers want to see the potential for two seasons at the very least. Not just because the second season is less expensive to produce now that the main assets have been designed and built, but also because the IP, the brand, is already established in people's minds. Hopefully, those people are even excited about the second and the third seasons. When this happens, broadcasters and streamers don't have to fight through all the other series to bring in viewers to your show. The idea is to keep the previous season's viewers and then caption, capture even more eyes for the second and third seasons. Back in October at Animalia, I worked with writers on seven different cool projects. Each one was interesting and special in its own right. But none of the creators were thinking about what their second season would look like. And that could be a real problem when you're trying to put together a co-production. The interesting thing for me was that a couple of the projects had so much story crammed into their first season that it was easy once we pulled it apart to see where the second and third season would go. Now, let's look at the term cross-platforming for a moment. Just to be clear, Cross-platforming is when an IP is strong and popular enough that uh, it can be developed to work on different entertainment media, like online games, books, toys, and even movies. Not only does this financially benefit the creators and producers, it reinforces the IP itself in people's minds, giving them new ways to explore and enjoy the IP. Probably the greatest example of this is Mickey Mouse and Disney, which I'll admit is one of my least favorite IPs in the world. But no one can argue that Mickey Mouse hasn't served old Walt Disney well. Not only was Mickey Mouse a popular cartoon, but he is also the face of a brand that includes movies, TV shows, theme parks, clothing, toys. The list just goes on and on and on. So what am I saying? That every successful international co-pro has to be what we call 
highly toyetic and designed to be a commercial for every licensing opportunity? No, though there are plenty of properties that demonstrate this approach and there will be plenty more, I'm sure, in the future. And who knows, maybe you have a winning IP that plays with that trope. The good news is that the Anglo-centric producers, broadcasters, and streamers are opening their minds, looking for new diverse stories. And those stories could be yours, especially if you keep at least some of their needs in mind. I've been taking a look at the series pitches for this forum, as well as the series that have come out of your countries in the past 20 or so years. And what I see are compelling situations that reflect their creators' histories, hopes, and dreams. Some of these series have gotten multiple seasons in their home country, but there are also many that have only had one season. And while just getting your vision, your series, onto the screens of viewers is a huge win, you know from experience that there is so much sweat and money poured into that season that it seems a shame not to be able to do at least one more season. So what is the secret to writing a successful international hit series? Well, if you ever find out, please share it with me. As I've said before, I've been in this business for 25 years. And the one thing I know for sure is that it's been a moving target every step of the way. But I can pin down one thing that everyone, and by everyone, I mean all the Anglo-centric broadcasters, producers, and streamers demand, character-driven stories. Let me say that again to you, character-driven stories. So what exactly is a character-driven story? It's where every story in your series is launched and developed by the wants, strengths, and most importantly, the flaws of your main character or characters. In order to achieve that, you must build fully fleshed out characters, characters that can provide what we call a window into your stories, characters that are so strong and fully developed that when a viewer watches that show, they imagine themselves inside that story. When I did the most recent story lab for series at Animalia this year, the participants came into class talking about story-driven stories. I'm still not quite certain what that means, but I will say that once the participants in the intensive really dug in and nailed down their main characters, Building stories on what those characters wanted and what they were willing to do in order to get what they wanted was so much easier and a whole lot more fun. A simple way to illustrate this concept is think of one of your personal stories, the ones you tell to entertain people. The stories may be from your childhood or they may have happened to you uh, just the other day. Think of the kind of story you like to tell your friends over a drink or to people at a party. Think of a story where you wanted something so much and then did a couple of, um, let's just say, not particularly smart things to try to get what you wanted. But the result was that doing those not particularly smart things just ended up making the situation way worse. Those mistakes, you made trying to get what you want are what makes your friends interested in your story. It's what's making them laugh. And most importantly, it's what's moving your story forward. And if in the end of your story, you finally figured out how to get what you wanted in the right way, well, you have the perfect model for a character-driven story. It is just that easy. But Easy, simple things are hard to do, and I get that. This approach applies not only to kids' animation, but also to adult animation and really all script writing in general. But now please bear with me. I'm going to use Paw Patrol to talk about this concept once again. Here we have 
five to seven dog characters, each with a specific set of skills based on emergency services professions. There's a firefighter, a police officer, an aviator, plus a construction worker, an aquatic rescuer. You get the picture. You can see at a glance how each dog has its own specific look. And that's very important in animation. Whatever demographic you're aiming for, and that could be anywhere from young preschool to adult, that demographic should be able to identify your character at a glance, even if they're only seeing the silhouette. And it's just as important for each character to have its own set of skills and flaws. Taking Paw Patrol as an example, Chase, the German Shepherd po police dog, he's disciplined and reliable. But those strengths, when taken to extreme, also lead to him being stubborn and not listening to other characters' suggestions. Then there is Marshall, the Dalmatian fire dog, who knows how to get the job done, but also tends to be a little clumsy while he's doing it. Each of these dog characters have their own distinct personality, strengths, and flaws. And that's what moves the stories forward and keeps the kids coming back for more seasons. That's what keeps them demanding those Paw Patrol pajamas, lunch boxes, and action figures. And that's what's going to make those kids' parents buy the upcoming Paw Patrol movie. But most important of all is Ryder the high-spirited 10-year-old boy who is the leader of this elite team of pups. Ryder is smart and well-spoken, relied upon by the adults to solve the problems of his hometown, Adventure Bay. But as smart and reliable as Ryder is, he can also be impulsive, jumping to conclusions about how to approach problems. Ryder is what we call the window for the viewer. Now, by window, I mean that the viewer can identify with this character, imagining him or herself in the character's place. In some cases, the viewer might even aspire to be like the character. The concept is super important in kids' animation, but it also applies to adult animation as well. Think of the characters Archer and Lana in the adult spy series, Archer. Who doesn't want to be a super attractive super spy, jetting around the world, fighting evil masterminds and sleeping with gorgeous models? Now, I'm not telling you that your series must have a male hero whose high spirits and bravado get him into comedic scapes, scrapes. Your main character or characters could be male, female, or non-binary. They could be a human, an animal, or a blob. It could be a crazy inventor and his nephew, or three superhero girls who fight an evil monkey, or even a happy-go-lucky sponge who works at a fast food restaurant under the sea. My point is that when you develop your series, the development starts with your main character or characters. Start there, and you will have a much easier time of building stories and pitching your series to the people who can help you make your series and get it in front of audiences. Next up in producers, broadcasters, and streamers demands is what is the specific demographic your show is aimed at? You're going to need to be able to answer this, so let's break it down simply. Demographics. Young, young preschool is ages two to four. Older preschool, four to six. Bridge, six to nine. Tween, 10 to 13. Teen, 14 to 18. Adult and family. I might as well be honest here. Almost every demographic I'm describing tends to do what we call watching up, meaning that kids want to watch shows that are for kids who are older than they are. If their parents will let them, preschoolers will watch Bridge, Bridgers will watch Tween, Tweens will watch Teen, and of course, teens are watching Archer, The Family Guy, and BoJack Horseman. And these demographics and the names we've called them vary from country to country. 
but understanding which demographic you're writing for and developing it with that in mind for suitability of plot and humor will go a long way in preparing you to pitch and talk about your series IP with, with producers, broadcasters, and streamers. It will also help you key into topics and situations that your demographic is dealing with, concerned about, or maybe just obsessed with. And when you build your story specifically for a demographic, you have a much better chance of connecting with your viewers. Something you should always be aware of when pitching is, is the series you're pitching actually right for this broadcaster or streamer? You would be amazed at how often an executive complains that creators are pitching them completely inappropriate series for their platform. Don't waste yours and the executive's time by pitching a violent competitive show with a complex arced plot to a preschool broadcaster. They won't be interested and they'll think you haven't done your research. This sounds obvious, but to many creators, it's not. Another issue that affects what you're pitching to whom is the style and length of your animated series. There are three kinds of approaches. Types of series. You have a reset show, a show with a season long hard arc, a show with a season long soft arc. Now there are exceptions for every rule, as I mentioned before, as it's just like everything is a moving target. But let's at least try to pin down what I mean for each type of show. Reset shows. SpongeBob is a reset show. So are Fairly Odd Parents, Rick and Morty, and Camp Lake Bottom, which is one of mine. It means that you can watch any episode at any point in the season and no need for any backstory. You don't need to know it at all. The character goes through an ordeal, trying to achieve something and making mistakes before finally figuring out how to win the day and get what she or he wants. Then in the next episode, the plot is reset. The character or characters are no more wise than they were at the beginning of the previous episode. In other words, they have reset. Reset shows are usually 11 minutes long, but they can be 22 minutes long or even five or seven minutes long. They're usually big on laughs. Broadcasters like reset shows because they can schedule them in any order and viewers can discover the show in mid season and still enjoy it because there is no backstory. They're not missing any important information so they won't get lost in the plot and then abandon the series. It's all out there on the screen for 11 or 22 hilarious minutes, and then it's on to another story. Preschool shows, both older and uh, younger preschool, are reset shows. Small children don't usually follow huge plots with twists and turns. They get drawn in by simpler narratives and then watch the same show or movie over and over and over again and driving their parents crazy. Next up, season long hard arc shows. Troll Hunters is a hard arc show. So is Kipo in the Age of Wonder Beasts, Adventure Time and The Dragon Prince. These shows have a hard arc for each season, meaning that the main character or character's mission stretches over 12 or 13 episodes, usually culminating in some sort of epic battle where all seems lost until the hero character finally triumphs or seems to triumph. What is that new danger that is lurking in the foreground? <laughs> this happens, of course, because the season needs to end on a cliffhanger so that viewers will be on the edge of their seats waiting for the next season and the next and the next. Now, broadcasters have a hard time scheduling hard arc shows. Viewers have to make an appointment to watch them. And frankly, that's just not the trend in entertainment these days, especially for younger viewers. 
And if a viewer misses an episode, they won't completely understand the next episode and then probably won't care about following the following episode. Broadcasters can't afford to have viewers fall off their radar like this. We also know that viewers are tending to binge watch and hard arc shows are perfect for this kind of viewership. It's for these reasons that hard arc shows are a great approach for streamers like Netflix, Hulu and Amazon. Once a viewer is hooked on a show, they don't have to wait for each episode to come out. They can devour a whole season in a couple of sittings. Then while they're wondering what to watch while waiting for the next season, the smart streamer makes suggestions that follow along those lines and their viewers' tastes. And finally, soft arc shows. Monster High is a soft arc show. Teen Titans, Gravity Falls, and Steven Universe are soft arc shows. Soft arc shows have, you guessed it, a soft season arc. It may be a mission or a mystery, but that mission or mystery isn't an integral part of enjoying a single episode. The episode can stand alone if a viewer just happens to drop in. Think of a soft arc show like a picture puzzle. If you're missing three or four of the pieces, you still know what the entire picture is and you can enjoy it. So it just makes sense that soft arc shows are interesting to broadcasters as well as streamers, especially if you position them in this way when you're pitching. So why am I going on and on about all these concepts and catchwords? The reason I need to talk to you about all of this is that if you want to build a career in series animation, you are going to need to build a career internationally in series animation. And if you want an international career, you need to be able to speak to these concerns. Being able to pitch clearly and show that you already understand what the listeners' needs are will go a long way to produce, to impress producers, streamers, and broadcasters. And that is what will get them interested in actually reading your materials. Will they end up making your series? Let's be honest here. Odds are that they won't. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't pitch them. Pitching is one of the best ways to introduce yourself to a new client. Everyone is interested in hearing new ideas. Everyone's looking for the next new thing or the next version of whatever was the last new thing. Presenting a top-notch pitch, even if they're not interested in teaming up with you to get it done, can plant you firmly in their minds as a writer to develop their ideas. Now, I realize that there are some of you that are disappointed in hearing this. You don't want to work on someone else's ideas. You want to see your idea up on screens. You don't want to waste your time and precious creativity making someone else's dream come true. But I'm here once again to tell you that I've made a great career out of doing just this. And don't get me wrong. I've had a number of IPs optioned and one that got so close to being made. But so many issues come into play when green lighting a series that anything can derail this process. Decision makers move on to another company or get fired and the incoming management wants to put their mark on their entertainment slate. Or as it's happened, some huge tragedy happens that makes your post-apocalyptic tales seem like it's just bad timing. All sorts of things can and will change. But if you're writing, thinking and pitching is good. And if you have made a solid personal connection in the short time you've met with that executive, and if that executive decides they'd like your take on an idea that they have, you are halfway there to adding an important member to your network. Do good work for them and they could keep hiring you back. Do enough good work for them and they'll be hungry to hear more of your pitches. 
And who knows, maybe times will have changed and they'll be interested in making that first pitch that you made to them into a reality. But first, you must put yourself out there in order for all this to happen. And you must put yourself out there again and again and again. And lastly, the two words that are on every broadcaster, streamer, and studio executive's lips, diversity and representation. It's been a long time coming, but all parties are demanding that these concerns be met in all areas of producing an animated series. And you'll need to be able to address this in your meetings if and when it comes up. Just to give you an example of how rigid and male focused this industry has been. It wasn't 10 years ago that Canadian studios wouldn't option an animated series with a female lead unless it was meant for only female viewers. For at least five years, the prevailing wisdom was that boys wouldn't watch a female hero, but girls would be happy with a female secondary lead. This was crazy because we could all remember hit shows like Kim Possible and Atomic Betty, but no one would budge. Then Disney released Star versus the Forces of Evil, and it was a hit. Suddenly everyone wanted a female lead. Suddenly executives were pretending that the reason they weren't producing shows with female leads was because writer creators weren't bringing these characters to them. This is an example of the moving target I've been speaking about. Similarly, animated series that featured human characters were predominantly white and suburban. At the beginning of my career, one way to insinuate diversity was to have an all animal or inanimate objects cast of characters. After all, you can project any race onto an Arthur or a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle character. Then, surprisingly, after the 9-11 terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, some of these ideas and rules that have been taken for granted started to change. BIPOC creators and producers started this trend, developing IPs that reflected their community's lives. From here, we get Boondocks and 16 Hudson and arguably the Proud Family. BIPOC, female, and disabled characters started being integrated into shows. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that those characters were usually written by and voiced by white actors. So what am I saying here? That white males can't write for other characters? No, I am definitely not saying that. But writers, teams, and production need to be much, much more diverse. When I began my career 25 years ago, I was the token woman in the room. And that model of a team of white male writers with a token white female has persisted well into the 21st century. But change can't happen overnight. My writing partner, Rob, who happens to be a white male, and I have been involved with an initiative to mentor emerging BIPOC writers from the start. It's been super interesting. And as participants have learned the craft and started their careers, very rewarding. By the way, Rob and I ha actually have four mentors of our own who we're still in touch with to ask for advice and sometimes just to commiserate with. We can't really return the favor of mentoring them and they don't need jobs from us. So how do we return the favor? By paying it forward. And that's what my partner, Rob, and I are doing, paying forward all the help and support that these four mentors have given us over the years. We're mentoring because we were mentored and we're doing it to help writers who have been underrepresented in the past come in and join in the telling of stories. Now, I realize that some of you are just starting out in your careers. You are barely out of school. Others have been out of school for a little time, maybe getting their start in animation for gaming. So many of you are just trying to get your foot in the door. And here I am talking about mentoring. Yep, 
It's never too early or too late to start, especially if you open your mind. Early on, this mentoring might take the form of writer support groups, or it might just be allowing a new graduate to sit in while you and your partners pitch ideas. However you do it, I guarantee that you will learn as much from anyone you support as they will learn from you. But you need to be open to writers, animators, and producers who are not in your cohort. You don't have to be purposely avoiding diversity to find yourself in a room full of talent who looks, talks, and thinks exactly as you do, because you all came from the same life experience. And once again, this is what the broadcasters, streamers, and producers are going to be asking you to address at some point in your pitching process. If you have already been proactively thinking and working in this direction, you won't have any problem answering their concerns. You will have already kept their needs in mind, and that always shows you at your best. Keeping broadcasters, streamers, and producers' needs in mind while creating stories that are, are uniquely yours, it can be quite the balancing act. But the more you build your network, the more you collaborate and support and connect with others, the easier it will be to develop your ideas into fully blossomed IPs that will delight and meet the needs of broadcasters, streamers, producers, and most importantly, your viewers. So finally, it is my greatest hope for each and every one of you that you get your opportunity to create stories that are uniquely yours. Stories that leap out of your lives and your community's experiences. Stories that get richer and deeper by collaborating with others. And that those stories, your stories, are seen and celebrated around the world. Thank you. You mean because I was de I've got a I've got a creative job where I'm ex you know putting my heart heart and soul into a project and then I've got to do business. Uh, well, I mean, generally speaking, no, because I, I'm pretty pragmatic and I used to be an actor, so I'm also kind of I'm kind of used to the idea that I am always going to be balancing my creative process with satisfying what the business needs are there. You know, I used to, you know, I, I, I had commercials on the air and, and did that. So I was kind of used to doing that. But what I will say that caused me to lose heart was um, with pitching and with, and with creating work was there was a point in the Canadian animation scene, like, as I mentioned before, we were very lucky when we started, there was so much work around that we, we were able to get our start writing on other people's shows and we learned from people because they needed stories. And as that started to ebb away and uh, broadcasters realized that the internet was here to stay, go, you know, why they didn't understand that at an earlier point, I don't know, but because we were constantly talking to them about it. Once they realized that the internet was here to stay and that it was eating away a bit at their, um, at their television, at their broadcast, their audiences, uh, they stopped buying stories and they were not producing anything. We were also lucky. The other thing that happened right around just before that time was uh, Rob and I, my writing partner, we saw the writing on the wall so that's when we started focusing on pitching internationally rather than just pitching in our home country. So the two points where I would have been very tempted to just go, this is ridiculous. And uh, everybody, you know, I, I can't satisfy anybody's needs and, and I could do better doing something else was the point where we changed directions and thought outside the box. So that's why I guess I'm, I'm sort of banging the drum that international uh, sales, international co-pros are really, really important to you because just, just because your country is not necessarily 
doing this kind of business, there could be another country with, and other producers over there are interested in putting together a co-production and then, oh, surprise, surprise, it's a moving target and, you're, and you will find, could find funding in your own country. It happens that way. Uh, where can you find mentors? Uh, what I would suggest, where did we find our first mentor? Anybody you know who does is already in the industry and is, is the potential for a mentor. Um, so my first, my first mentor was because Rob was in, uh, was doing storyboards at Nelvana, which was a big Canadian company. So we, he uh, asked a favor of one of, the, of one of the story editors. He asked for materials. He asked if it would be possible that we could write a sample script. And if uh, that, if Dale, that was the name of, that's the name of that mentor, had time to give us a note on them. So it can, it can be with, purpose like that, where you go, I know you're busy. I know I'm not ready to write for your show, but would it be possible for me to get the Bible from you, which is the sort of the summation of the project and write some sample springboards for you and just to get your thoughts. That's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it, uh, friends of friends. That was another important mentor of ours. We had a friend who knew another story editor and basically um, she set up a dinner where the four of us were going to go out for dinner together. We were taking them out to dinner. I mean, that's that, that cost, but that was good, it paid off. Um, funny enough, our friend who connected us with the, our, our mentor actually couldn't end up coming to it. So it was just Rob and myself and Kate, and funny story with that, um, she said, uh, we finished this great talk. We had a great dinner. We had a great talk asking her about all of her experience. And then she said to us at the end of the meal, she said, well, are you gonna ask me if, if I'll read any of your stuff? And we were like, oh, would you? And uh, which is incredibly naive. Um, I don't suggest that you wait for someone to ask if they're going, if they can read your stuff. So my lesson from that would be make the ask, what we call make the ask. Would you mind if I sent you a little of my material for your thoughts? You know, don't ask for a job, ask for thoughts. Similarly, at the end of that meeting, she also said, what are your names? And I mean, we said Shelly and Rob. And she said, no, your last names. So that's how, how uh, I guess, naive we were at the time. But just going out there, see, we were rank beginners in that sense. We, we'd only written one animation script before. So we still took people out. I would recommend taking... Uh, calling uh, somebody who you're interested in, who's done work that you like, and asking them, taking them out for a coffee or a beer or whatever. Um, you don't have to do a full dinner. We don't do that that often anymore. But really, taking, offering to take them out and pick their brains, we do this all the time with new writers. And then the mentoring is something that kind of develops. You always want to be very respectful of their time um you want to be uh you don't want them to worry that you're going to be harassing them for work you always want the work that you show to them you want to make certain that that's the best best pass you've got on that work because they're not going to want to see you know they'll probably sit in a pile of reading for a couple of weeks and the last thing you want to do is to uh is to email them two weeks later and go, well, here's a better pass. They want to feel like this is the best pass you've got. This is what I'm going to make comments on. Um, that's, that's kind of it. And then, like I said, don't, don't discount those writers groups because there are more experienced writers in your writers groups. 
So you might even just, what I did with, with somebody I was mentoring just recently was I sent him to another writer's group that was headed by somebody who is a, um, that I mentored, that Rob and I mentored. And so he not only joined the writer's group, but then when it came time for him to pitch to a producer, he practice pitched to the person I mentored. So that's a, like a mini mentoring. And he can always touch base with that person because now they have this connection. Oh, you must start with your own stuff. Like don't, don't ever stop developing IPs because then you will pitch those IPs and then development goes on. Usually the development goes on for years. If you'll remember that what the example I gave you about um, Paw Patrol, which I know is not a small, Spin Master is not a small company, but it was just starting out at that point. It took, it took about, four or five years of development before it got on, uh, like got into like animation production. So you just constantly want to be developing ideas. You constantly want to have be having a slate of development that you can then bring and pitch to other countries with, with uh, more money potential. You, you want to have a broad range. I mean, this is a film example, but I, I can't remember exactly which, which screenwriter it was, but he got, he got his first uh, movie uh, film produced, script produced, and then of course, and it was a hit. And then everybody wanted, you know, what else have you got? What else have you got? Luckily, he had been writing other film scripts for years. You couldn't just whip one up over the weekend when people are asking, timing is important. So you keep developing, you keep creating new IPs, developing and developing, and then pitching them to those other big countries. Don't worry about uh, developing what we call the licensing, the swag. You, can, you could do a little mock-up of how it would look on a backpack or on pajamas, like you could do a, a picture of it, a cut and paste, but don't, don't put that kind of money into it. Like, you know, when I explained with the uh, Paw Patrol, the designs that the uh, creator of Bob the Builder came up with are so different from what uh, they ended up using. Way less toy addict way more what what spin master wanted in terms of the toys themselves so yeah you've got limited money ideas if you're a small production company then um then well let's face it you you've got somebody out you can you can take an hour or a couple of hours each week and sit in the room and brainstorm your ip and then send one person off to start the writing process on it, developing the characters, agreeing about that. That I know people's time is worth money, but when you're beginning, the time is the currency that you've got. So invest it wisely in developing it and not worrying too much about, um, like I said, the mock-up of toys and, and stuff like that. So now, um, yeah, I'm going to say that when Rob and I first started out, we would get now, mind you, people weren't using iPads in those days. So we would do expensive postcards up, um, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, and really, uh, really, that wasn't, that really what, it was a loss. I still have those postcards. They're great, but they didn't, they didn't get us anywhere and they cost money. Um, so you can have it on an, you can do designs, but, you know, do them on an iPad so people can lean in and look at them and stuff like that. And then you can send the digital copies to them if they're interested in reading. Now, in terms of how much um, development you want to do before you start pitching, uh, it's a moving target again. You know, at one point they were like, just bring us what we call a one sheet, which is kind of like a, a ad, you know, bouncy, like advertising style, one page about what the show is about and a quick you know sentence about each of the major characters and maybe a little bit of information at the bottom about you know the creative team behind it uh, 
And then people started going, but then, you know, if they are interested in that, they're going to want to have digital, uh, they want to have material, read materials. So you kind of need to be able to have it all developed so that you like from one sheet, characters, location, so that you can then, and springboards, so that you can then send that material very quickly if somebody is interested in it. They used to say they didn't want scripts. Now everybody is asking, do you have a script? Um, so do they, do they read the script? Is it better to approach them with something short, like a synopsis or like a one page? That is what, that is what the one sheet is about, is to get them started on. Sending somebody a script right off the bat to like, you know, introduce yourself, chances are they're not going to read it. Sending somebody, a, you know, sending somebody a one sheet or, or pitching what is essentially a short pitch will get them in, uh, interested in reading more because that's what you're always trying to do. You're getting, you're trying to get them interested enough that they will give up some of their precious time because they are inundated with pitches. You're trying to get them tempted and going, I need to read more. So that's- Do you, uh, do you use NDAs to protect your, your ideas? Uh, how, precious, how precious do you have to be with, uh, with your, with Shay? No, more often than not, if there's an NDA, it comes from the production company itself or from the broadcaster. Um, really, you, you're the low person on the totem pole, excuse the expression. Um, you, yeah, you are, you're pretty much at the bottom. So you're, the best one though was we actually, the uh, Irish Canadian co-pro that uh, we were going to do that, that production company, we love them. Uh, they actually gave us an NDA that they signed as well. That was a reciprocal NDA, which was just like, that was very respectful. But generally speaking, unless, you know, do your, do your, your research. If there's a, there's once in a blue moon, there's somebody who is, is, a uh, you know, isn't trustable out there. But for the most part, you just need to get it out there into the open. It's not going to do and do you any good. It's not going to get discovered if it's sitting on your desktop and not getting out there or in your drawer. You need to get it out there and you need to trust that people that people are for the most part not going to try to rip you off. And can I do one last thing on the last part of that question? Is you can do, you can pitch one, one series, come in to pitch a series, one series with a full pitch. It can be, it can be like what I was saying with that one sheet and showing them character designs and describing each of the characters and a sample story. Um, or you can do, like what happens quite often is just come in to do multiple pitches, in which case you really want to be able to give it a what we call an elevator pitch, which is a very short pitch where you get the, uh, the, the you know, the idea of the show, how exciting the character, you know, these short, short little characters, maybe five minutes long, and then if they're interested, they'll ask you questions. That's always a good sign. If they're asking questions, you may call up some designs and go, see, well, this is what we're looking at. This is what we're looking at. And then they uh, go, yeah, that isn't gonna work. What else have you got? So you're doing them like in really quick increments. Don't, if you're going in and going to pitch a bunch of uh, different series ideas, don't give them the full pitch. Rob and I did that once, and I think we almost killed our executives. They were exhausted. Luckily, they're still nice to us, but that was definitely a mistake. We kept them for probably close to two hours, and they were like this by the end of it. They were good pitches. They just, it just was too much. It was great. I mean, it was great. We started out, um, and it's like mentor, and everybody was being mentoring to each other. Like when we, the first day when I told everybody, that they were going to be uh, not just reading, but participating in front. I, I literally had one participant just go, oh, 
<sighs> and but in the end, he was one who was going, this is great. Uh, I really loved getting the uh, feedback. We we do do a uh, we do a short a short uh, what you call beat or session on how to give feedback. So it's a safe feedback situation. It's it's people talking about what they're liking out of a pro project, which is really important, not just for mentors, but just being a good creative partner. Talk about what you like, and then talk about uh, a couple of things that would be a possibility that you you know could be a possibility, but most often what you're just what isn't quite making sense to you or what ifs about it. People really got into it and they got great ideas from each other. And the best part of it also was that they got used to even the people who were the most shy and it was easily, you know, half were not like excited about sitting up and reading their stuff you know, in the first day or two. And by the end, they were getting to be really good storytellers. Um, they got used to it. We did, uh, we took one of the teams and uh, set them up in a, uh, a mock uh, pitch situation for what it would be like if you were doing it at a conference. And uh, so everybody got a chance. They did a great job of it. Everybody got a chance to see what they were doing. And I'd been teaching these concepts before and they got a chance to put it on its feet. It just, I'm, a, I'm the lead mentor, but it works out that everybody was, everybody ended up supporting and mentoring each other quite a bit. Well, if it's my writing, if it's my writing room, Ryan and Rob's, yes, we have a schedule for the day because we need to get through, uh, you need to get through X amount of work and get everybody up to speed on what the show is, get their questions answered. And then, frankly, then we need to, in our case, because we were doing a reset show, we need to get X amount of uh, springboards, what we call springboards, stories going forward so that they can, they can go into the scheduling. Um, so how does this happen? Uh, the last, the last uh, writer's room that uh, we did was for the show we're show running right at the moment. It's a, it's an older preschool show. Uh, we had, we had five writers, five senior to medium writers working uh, with us. And we had four, what we call emerging writers, uh, also coming in. So everybody was given the materials that we were going to work on. So that, and that would be the Bible with a one sheet and the characters and the locations and some springboards and two, what we call gold standard, at least at that point, scripts. So it was, at, to, at, we gave all of this information to everybody a week ahead of time. Sometimes it's not that you don't get that much head time. Sometimes it's literally like three days and then they go, oh, and please give us pitches for the stories like, you know, a day or two days beforehand. We like to everybody to have lots of time. So they get all this information, they digest all this information, and then we ask them to give us three to five springboards, like possible stories, not much more than 400 words and deliver them to us by uh, the afternoon before the, the writer's room. Then Rob and I will go over all of these springboards, making notes and we'll discuss and we'll pull out with the senior media, uh, uh, medium experienced writers, we'll pull out two springboards each that we feel are uh, have good potential and uh, are not conflicting with each other about what the uh, about you know you can't have two stories about getting hiccups so you want we go okay so those are those are 10 stories there and then one story for each one potential story for each of the emerging writers so then what happens in the room when the time comes? Uh, we, do, we did a morning where we introduced 
the the uh, the studio, like the broadcaster, head of broadcasting, to the group. So she got to do a little, you know, a little curtsy dance to all of us about what how this project started and why she wanted to do it. Then we had uh, then we had the director talking a little bit about the project and maybe showing a couple of designs that they have seen already, but you know, up everybody oohs and ahs. And then pretty after everybody's introduced themselves to everybody else, we get to work on breaking stories. So we'll just start calling one writer by one writer and saying, okay, uh, would you do us a favor and read to us your story, you know, hiccups, hiccups, let's just say for argument's sake, reads out the uh, springboard to everybody and and then we say, okay, so this is what this is what we're thinking about this story. Here's an issue that's happening. It's not starting quite early enough, or it's feeling a you know it needs to be broken down in this fashion to uh, to get it active and fun to to plumb all the funny out of it. And the group will then uh, basically put up their hands, or uh, you know figuratively if it's online. And I have done this online, and start you know, tossing ideas around. And Rob and I will start building those ideas as we're tossing them around. Are we getting, you know, are we introducing the uh, problem off the beginning, right off the bat at the beginning? What is the inciting incident? Have we got something that shoots us into the activity of the story? What are they going to try? What's funny about how they make this mistake? What is the next try that they're going to make? What's funny about that mistake? And what is going to be the solve? How, what is the answer? And we'll, this will be a group uh, job. This will be, we'll all be brainstorming together, being supportive and generous with our ideas. That's what we want in a writing room. If you're somebody who just likes to write by yourself, then, then fine, then you should not go into a writing room because you need to be supportive and contribute to other people's ideas. And one thing that Rob and I do as well, when, we come, when we're invited into somebody else's writer's room is A, because we're a, we're a team and we cost a little more for them to have a team. We always have at least, at least five springboards between the two of us, usually a little closer to six written out. But then we also have like just a page of ideas that we were working on, but did, you know, didn't completely come out. The fact is, is then we start cannibalizing our own work when uh, we're listening to other people's ideas. You know, just to use the hiccup idea again, somebody is uh, the, you know, the, the another writer is breaking a, a hiccup story and we will literally say, well, we had a hiccup story, but we don't we don't need it. So let's take this idea from us. We had this idea that we would bring this into it. What do you think about that? And then working it. You need to be generous. You need to be collaborative. You need to spread this feeling of if I share with other people my creativity and my ideas and my support, that they will do the same back to you. And occasionally bad behavior is rewarded, but generally speaking, uh, as story editors, we're very much aware of who doesn't collaborate, who, who doesn't, uh, who isn't generous. I have worked with one writer who we, there was some pressure for us to take on in our, our last story, uh, our last story summit, our last writer's room. And, but she has a, she has a problem with, she will, argue down other people's pitches and go, well, that won't work and this won't work, and, uh, but I have a pitch and then she'll bring out hers and she'll try to pitch hers over top of somebody else's. And Rob and I have no time and patience for that kind of uh, behavior. It's, you need to be generous, you need to be collaborative, you need to be supportive. And that's, and you, you know, you need to bring in ideas that you are perfectly happy to throw into the pot and help somebody else's great stories go forward. Really important. 
minute uh, when you're starting off, you need to do you need to sow as many seeds as possible. You know, you need you need to even if it it seems right at the beginning that it's not the pays. I don't know what the pay is going to be like or anything like that, but you we jump in. We're helpers. It's paid off. So, you know, as if you feel that you like these, you like the person you're meeting with and they're uh, and you like where they're heading, then help them move forward. They will not forget you if, you know, as they build. That's how you build the relationships. Remember when I mentioned the business about, you know, a producer wanting your take on their ideas? We don't, we don't worry about, we give that away. When they interview us, it's, you know, even right to this day, and our time is worth, is worth money, even this day, the take is for free. So, you know, if as long as they get, as long, if they're interested in hearing what we think about something that they're going to do, even if they don't end up hiring us, that becomes an audition for us working with that producer. And we've had gotten calls like years later and uh, where they they went, yeah, we loved your take on it. It wasn't right for what we were doing, but we love the way you think. And so we haven't forgotten you all these years later.